Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and a morning show or an evening show, depending on where you are in the world. Anyway, we are delighted to welcome Bruce M. Patty, who is uh, joining us from New Zealand. He has lived in Saipan for several years. He's also compiled a series of books uh, on the oral histories of the battle. His books can be linked below and found through his website. Now, Bruce, you've got, it seems that you have you got YouTube open, Bruce. Do I have YouTube open? Yeah. No, I haven't opened No, it's all right. So it's, my, it's a problem at my end. We're better now. There we are. I'm sorted. Sorry there's double audio there, folks. So, Bruce, tell us about um, where you've lived over the last few years, because you started in California, and then you lived in uh, overseas for a while. So tell us about your movements. Well, I was born and raised in uh, California. I enlisted in the uh, Naval Reserves at Alameda Naval Air Station while I was still in high school back in the 60s. And then I did uh, my active duty on uh, the USS uh, Yorktown during the Vietnam War. Yorktown was a World War II era Essex class aircraft carrier. I was an aviation ordnance man on, on, uh, on Yorktown. And then I went to the University of California, Santa Barbara. On the GI Bill, majored in history. Um, yeah, I worked at the minimum wage jobs for a while, and get till I got tired of it. Then I went back to school and got into the medical profession, which I did for over twenty years. But I probably spent more time reading history books than medical journals. Uh, eventually, I did a lot of traveling in Europe and Asia and stuff on my vacations. I eventually got married. My wife's a pediatrician from France. But she's a U.S. citizen. Uh, anyway, uh, we were looking for some overseas assignments. Uh, I wasn't finding anything in nuclear medicine that was particularly interesting. But as a pediatrician, she uh, told me, well, you know, they're looking for a pediatrician in some place called Saipan. Have you ever heard of it? I said, boy, have I? Yeah, there was a pivotal battle fought there during World War II. So she made some inquiries. But I said, you know, before we just leave our comfortable position here at Kaiser Hospital in Vallejo. Maybe we ought to check this out before we make a big leap. So um, they arranged for us to come over in June of 1994 to do a, a two-week locum. And it was just uh, serendipitous that that was the uh, 50th anniversary of the Battle of Saipan. Mm -hmm. So here we are collecting our baggage on at the airport in Saipan. I'm meeting all these Marines and Army and Air Force and Navy personnel there started talking to them. And then of course at the hotel where we stayed, I'm meeting more of them. And I was starting to hear their stories. I just became really fascinated by it. And when I got back uh, to California, uh, I would start actually interviewing some of my patients who looked like they did right. the world. Okay. So I don't want to get too long winded there, but then um, we ended up going back there for five years. And so I was uh, reading everything I could. I was uh, physically exploring Saipan, Tinian, Rota, Guam. Uh, after about a year, I had volumes of notes, but uh, no focus to them. And as you'll see in one of the slides, uh, while I was at a, at a hotel swimming pool with my kids, I met this woman who was more interested in my kids than I was. But her name was Vicky Vaughn, but her maiden name was Setchen Akiyama. And she started telling me about what her life was like growing up in Saipan back in the 30s and then how the war came along and changed everything. Uh, how she had lost her grandfather, her father. Uh, she, had, she was one of 10 children. She was only one of three to survive the war. And she lost uh, other members of her extended family. And all of a sudden I became focused and I'm thinking, most of the books written about World War II in the Pacific are about the Japanese and the Americans and, and our allies. But most of you think about it, most of the fighting was done on somebody else's real estate. You yeah. know, the Micronesians, the Melanesians. And so now here's this woman who's telling me the story. And I and I just, I had never done any oral history interviews before, but I said, you know, would you mind if I, I got a tape recorder and maybe we sat down and we would uh, record your story and I'm not transcribe it. Maybe we'd get it published in a magazine or something, not knowing at the time that I was going to do more of this and turn it into a book. Mm -hmm. um, and she said, you know, she'd like to do that because she's tried to tell her own children what happened during the war, but she couldn't talk about it without crying. And her children didn't like seeing their mother cry. So they made her stop. Wow. So I, she said, I'll do it. And but of course she did. She cried all the way through it, talking about her father just disappeared. Nobody knows what happened. Uh, 
uh, seeing her little brother die before her, uh, seeing uh, relatives around her die. Uh, she still has scars on her back from a flamethrower, American flamethrower. Wow. Uh, we went through five sessions before we had a good story, I thought, and she agreed. And, uh, and then I thought, well, there's other stories like this. Nobody tells the stories about what happened to the Melanesians, the Micronesians. Mm -hmm. It's all about the Japanese, the Americans, the Australians, the Dutch, the British. And also, so, a lot of people write books without having traveled to the areas. That's that's one of the things I discovered. That is, is they write based on all the after action reports and things which are fantastic. But it seems to me you've got that knowledge of the of the ground, the people, and just absorbing the culture. So, well, we'll, we'll get going with the, uh, the the PowerPoint. So, folks, fire away with questions, and we'll put them to Bruce as we go along. And uh, Bruce, when you want me to move on the slides, just just nudge me forward, and we'll we'll learn about some of this work you've done. Okay, well, this is just the cover of the book I wrote. It took me five years <laughs> to get it. It took me another 10 months to find a publisher. And all of a sudden, I had three offers. But uh, And then the, the beginning of the end, that's the uh, title of the official Marine Corps history of the right. Battle of Saipan. Because obviously, when we took Saipan, even the Japanese knew it was up because they were aware of the B-29s that uh, were capable of flying from the Mariana Islands to Japan. So anyway, that's the, the title of my book. And uh, then we can move on. And of course, the reason for taking it was because of the B-29. Uh, it was twice as big as the B-17. It was, a matter of fact, the most expensive project in World War II. The B-29. Yeah, more expensive than the Manhattan Project. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. Uh, it's twice as big as the B-17. It had the pressurized uh, fuselage, uh, computerized gun systems. Had a lot of bugs in it, though, of course, especially the engines overheating. But that was the reason they took it. And, of course, as soon as the Seabees could get in there on Saipan and Tenin, later Guam expand the uh, airfields that the Japanese had built, then uh, the war was taken home uh, to the Japanese. So we can go to the next slide. And, of course, I like to use maps. Uh, this is just... Uh, uh, the, the Pacific overall pointing to where the Mariana Islands are. But I like to use maps in all of my lectures because as I've discovered uh, from uh, an article I'd read some years ago, uh, when American high school students were tested on their knowledge of uh, geography, over 50% of them thought they lived in Brazil. So, um, <laughs> Well, every time we do a Pacific show, Bruce, we just add that reminder, it's big. However big you think it is, it's bigger than that. And the distances are extraordinary. And, you know, you see a map like that where it looks like all those island chains are just, you know, close together. But the, the scale is ridiculous. So the, the Pacific is big. It's an odd statement, but it's absolutely true. Absolutely correct. And we can go to the next slide. And this is just give you the uh, a close up of the uh, Mariana Islands. It's uh, sort of uh, an arc of islands that runs north to south. Uh, they're all volcanic in origin. Some of them are still active. Uh, Guam is the biggest and the oldest, but there's uh, no volcanic activity there. Same with Rota, same with Tinian and Saipan. But as we get further north, if you uh, notice Anatahan, uh, it started erupting again back in uh, 2003. And during the war, when B-29s were coming back, you know, there were submarines and ships all, all up and down there to rescue some uh, crews from B-29s that couldn't make it all the way back to base. And for whatever reason, a B-29 coming back to Saipan or Tinian from a mission decided to crash land in the caldera on An Anatahan. I don't know why they didn't uh, land near the, in the water, but uh, there were 21 Japanese holdouts on Anatahan. They didn't surrender until 1951 or 1952. Hmm. So there's 20 guys and one woman. Uh, they got to that uh, crash site. All the crew were dead. So they used the parachutes to make new clothing, some of the aluminum, make pots and pans. And they also took the, uh, the um, sidearms from the crew and they started fighting over the women. Uh, but that's a whole other story. Hmm. Uh, but we can move on to the next slide. And uh, this is the woman you see in the photograph is uh, Sechana Akiyama. She's the one who got me going on this. She was the first oral history interview I did with that. And the photo on the, uh, on the right there, that is her father who came down to Saipan in the early 20s. He was a student. He fell in love with Saipan and also fell in love with a young Chamorro woman who he eventually married and had seven children with. That's... Uh, that is uh, Vicky or Sechan's uh, mother. But she died sometime in the 30s. And then he married her sister and had three more kids. 
But like I said, when I talked to her, she told me that she was only one of three of the 10 who survived. And this is a photograph I took with uh, my two daughters who uh, uh, were quite young at the time. The one on the left, uh, Anne Marie, she is now a captain in the U.S. Army. So. Mm, brilliant. Let me move on. And, uh, you know, a lot of people think, well, uh, the Japanese were really cruel. Uh, they really exploited people. Wherever you think of uh, the rape of Nanking, you think of... Uh, of the Bataan death march, all of that was true. But see, uh, <clears throat> the Japanese were an ally in World War One, and uh, when we went, when the uh, when England and France went to war with Germany, uh, they simply moved down and took over uh, what was then German Micronesia and Melanesia, because <clears throat> uh, of course the, the Germans had purchased all of these uh, Micronesia from the Spanish in 1899 after the Spanish-American War. And they were only there for about 15 years. They were there for economic reasons. They didn't build that up militarily. Uh, and the Japanese simply came down and chased the Germans away. There was no bloodshed. And now with the Treaty of Versailles, they were allowed to stay there under a, cla a Class C mandate under the old League of Nations. And basically, they were there for economic reasons too. They had a population explosion in Japan and they couldn't even grow enough food to feed themselves. So uh, they sent a lot of their people from Okinawa and Japan down there, and they exploited the islands for economic reasons. They uh, uh, introduced sugar cane, coffee, pineapple. Uh, a lot of them intermarried with the people. Uh, uh, they treated the locals, the Chamorros and Carolinians, like second-class citizens. They had to go to segregated schools. They couldn't go past the fifth grade, but they brought a real uh, economy to the islands for the first time. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, of course this all changed then when World War II came along and then the Americans came along and pretty much obliterated the place. Mm -hmm. And I interviewed people who grew up during the Japanese period and they say, you think, you Americans think you came here to liberate us. You didn't liberate us, you destroyed the place. And, and then when the war was over, you just left us to clean up the mess. Uh, and when I was living there in the 1990s, every spring and summer, there were Japanese, Okinawans, and even Koreans who were living there because Koreans were nominally Japanese, according to the Japanese at that period. And they would come back uh, for reunion. They, they would commemorate their friends who were who they lost there during the war, but they also came back there to meet with the families that they had been so close to before the war came along. So... Uh, I, that's why I refer to 1914 to 1944 as the golden years for the Chamorros. It's much better now, mm. uh, but you know what got the economy going it was back in the 60s and 70s when they opened up the Mariana Islands for uh, for foreign investment. And who came back first? It was the Japanese. They built mm. hotels, golf courses, and they brought the economy back. The Americans didn't. Well, thanks for that insight. And this is just a map showing the landing beaches. Uh, this involved two uh, Marine Corps divisions, the 2nd and 4th Marine Corps Division, and one U.S. Army Division, the 27th, which initially were being held in reserve because they wanted to use them for the landings on Guam that were supposed to take, uh, take place later. But the Japanese were putting up so much resistance that they started feeding in the 27th piecemeally. And, um, but this shows you where they went. Uh, the, um, the, I think it was a... The 505 uh, Battalion of the 27th, uh, they were uh, dedicated to securing Naftan Point on the southern. Right. They secured they secured the air base there. Then the Second Marine Division, they were dedicated uh, to moving up the west coast of the island along the coast. The Fourth Marine Division came over the east coast <clears throat> and were moving up towards the north end. <clears throat> then the 27th had the the toughest part, they had to come through Death Valley because they had these two, uh, two ridges on either side of them dominated by the Japanese. Then the idea was to move in a contiguous line north, pushing the Japanese uh, uh, up to the north end of the island. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. And folks, if you haven't seen it, do watch our shows with Stephen McLeod, where he talks about the taking of Saipan. There's side stories about Lee Marvin and all sorts of other people there. So I'll add, I'll add the link to this description after the show. But uh, brilliant stuff so far, Bruce. People are loving it. Okay, great. Uh, now, this is just what uh, one of the landing beaches looks like uh, today. You can go to the next the slide. <clears throat> and uh, these are some of the tanks, the amphibious tanks that were supposed to come ashore 
Uh, some of them made it ashore, but some of them got into, fell into holes in their electric uh, circuitry cut out. And some of those tanks are still out there. Kids go out there and swim around them and climb on them. Next. Uh, this is an aerial view I took. I uh, chartered a small plane with a friend of mine whose father was in the 4th Marine Division out there and his uh, uncle was a CB on Tinia. But anyway, this is uh, some of the landing beaches. This is the coral reef that the uh, LVTs had to go over and yeah. then the lagoon there. Uh, if you look real close there, there's a place called Sugar Dock because right in back of it, there was a sugar cane refinery, okay? And they, uh, the Japanese blew a hole in the reef to take the finished product out by lighters out to ships waiting out there. Uh, so the 4th Marine Division were supposed to take uh, land the beaches just to the south of Sugar Dock and the 2nd Marine uh, to the north of that. Uh, and uh, uh, that just gives you an area of view. Now, you can, can't see it very well in the background. It's a place called Lake Susupi, which is actually a swamp. And uh, this is a village that the Japanese sugar refinery had built there. It's called uh, Chayan Kanoa. A lot of the buildings, uh, they were ferro, concrete, cement. A lot of them survived the war. And after the fighting, the ones, the, the, the islanders, since the main village of Garapan had been pretty much uh, leveled, uh, they moved in there. And a lot of them still live there today uh, on some of these old uh, ferro concrete structures that the Japanese built way back in the 1920s and 30s. Next wow. slide. And this is, I took from uh, the official Marine Corps history of the Battle of Saipan by then Major Hoffman, I think his name was. But this shows you where the 4th uh, and 2nd Marine Divisions landed and, and then uh, then moved inland. The next slide. But uh, this was taken from a Gingham Point. If you go back to that map again, I can show you. Yeah, and the very lower left-hand corner, just a little bit of a nub. That's a Gingham Point. And I took a photograph from there. There was a Japanese bunker down there that had been pretty much uh, uh, leveled uh, by the pre-invasion bombardment. And then go back to that photo. And then you can see there's the reef that the LVTs had to climb over. In the background, there's some pre-positioned ships. Each one of those ships has enough uh, equipment, everything from bullets to beans for entire Marine Corps battalion. Uh, I got to visit one of those. The captain one of the ships said during the first Gulf War, those ships were sent over to Saudi Arabia. The Marines were flown in. They offloaded all their equipment there before going into Kuwait. But you can see the reef there. They had to go over that. They were in the lagoon. And then next slide. <clears throat> uh, this is an archival photo. It's taken the north end of Saipan. You can see an airstrip there. The Japanese were started building it. Uh, after the island was secured, the CBs finished it, and uh, they flew uh, P-47 Thunderbolts off there. Matter of fact, when I gave a talk in Monterey oh, some years ago, a guy came up for, uh, after my lecture and said, yeah, he flew P-47s off there. Uh, not a very good photo, but up to the right a little bit up, you can see some of the ships that were involved, yep. over, over 500 uh, uh, ships, most of them coming from Pearl Harbor. A lot of it came from uh, Kwajalein. Um, and uh, you notice the cliff here. That's called Suicide Cliff because as the Japanese were being pushed north, a lot of the Japanese who got there, they had no place else to go. And a lot of them threw their children off the cliff and then followed them. That's over 800 feet high. Now, if they refused to jump, the Japanese would kill them. Mm -hmm. So it's a question of how much of that was murder, how much of it was suicide. Yeah. Likewise, I found out a few days ago, Bruce, that that's a popular place for honeymoon photos these days. Someone told me that a couple of days ago, which is which which it seems there's a big disconnect there. But where, it was a talk. Oh, yeah, we saw lots of, lots of Japanese weddings when they were there. Yeah. Uh, but the, now the Japanese that were on each coast when they were pushed up to the north end of the island. If you look down in the lower right-hand corner, you can see a little cliff into the ocean. Yeah. That's where others would, would throw their children and jump off. Now, at low tide, there's no water blur. There was just these limestone rocks. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these people landed there and died a very slow and agonizing death. Again, Japanese soldiers, if they uh, hesitated to jump, they were murdered. I interviewed a couple of people who were on destroyers sailing around the island and one of them, who was a gunnery officer on USS Twining, said when they sailed around the north end of the island after the 
fighting was over, uh, it was like a Saragosso sea of dead bodies. Terrible. Yeah, and some of the ships put uh, boats in the water to try to pull some of the women and children out. But the bodies were so thick, uh, one guy told me that they tangled the propeller on the ship's boat. So rather, mm. really some horrific stories to, mm. to be told there. Next slide, please. And this is after the uh, Saipan was secured. Uh, this is an aerial vo uh, view of the north end of the island. You can see the fighter strip there, but you can see all these Quonset huts there. Because after Saipan was secured, it also became a supply and support base for future operations, namely Iwo Jima and Okinawa, and for the planned invasion of the Japanese home islands that uh, never took place. Now, a lot of I've been in there. This is a lot of this has all fallen into ruin, and uh, the jungle has taken over a lot because really the Japanese, when they were there, they exploited it agriculturally. I mean, there were sugar cane coffee, pineapple. I even found 70, 80 foot avocado trees that were planted back in the 20s and 30s, still producing avocados. Next slide, please. And this is taken from Mount Tapachau. That's the highest point on the island. It's about uh, 1,500 feet high. I took the photo south towards Tinian, which you can't see much in the background. It's only three or four miles uh, south of there. And here's Chilean Kanoa uh, down there. Uh, there's just there's a few that's, uh, that the Japanese had of the uh, Marines and Army landing on their beaches there on 15 June. So next slide. And this is a view of Mount Tapachau taken from near where the beach is. If you look just to the left, you can see a little bit of a Catholic uh, church there. Well, that is where the old sugar refinery was. And then uh, that was destroyed during the pre-invasion bombardment. And then they built a Catholic church there. Uh, there's a cement structure there in the background. I think that's left over from the war too. Next slide. Just talking about the bombardment, we had a question from one of the viewers is saying on another podcast, one of the mistakes made by the US forces on Saipan was the lack of heavy artillery brought onto the island early in the campaign. Is that something you would agree with? Uh, not necessarily. I'll probably get into another slide, but the um, uh, army, I interviewed uh, one guy, uh, Roland Fraunheiser from Pennsylvania. He's with a I think it was the 33rd uh, Coast Artillery Battery. They had 155 long toms there. They had quite a bit of artillery that they brought ashore. Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, now this is going back to uh, uh, Mount Tapachau uh, because I interviewed Frank Borta. He was uh, one of many underaged uh, veterans from World War II. He was 16 years old. Uh, he was part of what they called the Bastard Battalion, 1st Battalion, 29th Marines. Uh, they were in California at the time. Uh, they were being put together uh, to be uh, made part of one of the new Marine Corps divisions that was coming along. Uh, but because they lost uh, three LSTs in Westlock and Pearl Harbor prior to uh, the, the Saipan campaign, and lost a lot of equipment and men, at the last moment, they decided to make the uh, 29th Marines a temporarily attached to the 2nd Marine Division. So they, so that's why they called themselves the, the Bastard Battalion. But there was elements of one of the platoons that found a way up to Mount Tapachau, and they held it there. There weren't a lot of Japanese up there. They held it, and then they sent a runner back down to let headquarters know that, hey, we were up here, but we need reinforcements. So they got them up there. They held off the uh, they held off the Japanese, uh, and they were up there for about two and a half weeks before the battle was finally secured. But I think there were about twelve hundred Marines in this twenty uh, ninth Marine uh, Regiment, if I remember correctly. And according to Frank Borta, by the time they were pulled off the line, two and a half weeks later, of those twelve hundred, there were only two hundred left alive mm. or not wounded. Now. Uh, Marvin Avila, who I made contact with after my book came out, this is interesting because you're doing these oral history interviews. There's only a couple of guys up there. Frank Borda tells it one way. And then when Marvin Avila reads his oral history, he says, no, that's not true. It happened this way. But another thing that Marvin, that's one of the things about oral history interviews, you know, you kind of try to try to corroborate what people say. You can go to archivals, research, and, and find people who are there with them. And uh, But it's not 100%. But the other thing, he says that in his company, by the time they got off Saipan, the company has, what, 100 men? There's only 17 of them that were not either killed, wounded, or missing in action. 
But then when they went into Okinawa, of those 17 survivors of Saipan, all 17 of them were either killed or wounded. Wow. In fact, he was, uh, he was wounded and he was uh, unconscious for three weeks. He said when I talked to him that when he, when he regained consciousness three weeks later, he was in a naval hospital in California and his mother was standing by his bed crying. But Frank Borda was later wounded. They were held back to uh, track down some of the stragglers that held out. The last stragglers to surrender didn't surrender until December 1945, something like four months after Japan surrendered. But he, during this hunt for stragglers, he was wounded, medically discharged. And while the war was still going on, he was back in high school. <laughs> Next slide. And this was... Uh, one of the, the uh, guns that the Japanese had back in the hills, they're the ones that really caused a lot of casualties uh, on D-Day, uh, 15 June 1944, because they were zeroed in on the reef and the beaches. So th they had something like 8,000 Marines ashore, uh, I think, uh, the first day, or I, I might, have, might have that mixed up. But by the end of the day, there were 2,000 uh, Marine and Army casualties. Uh, but... After the war, they sent in these salvage companies to clean up all the junk from the war. But some enterprise in Chamorro decided to save one of these Japanese guns, sort of made a memorial after. Whenever you'd go by there, you would see where Japanese had stopped by there. They left flowers, sake, um, prayer sticks to, uh, in remembrance of some of their friends who had died there. So next slide. And this is Naftan Point. Uh, I've been down there several times. There are a number of Japanese gun revetments in there, but only a couple of them had guns in them. And uh, what I discovered was that uh, originally the landings in Saipan were not scheduled for November of 1944, but the Marshall's campaign moved along so fast, Nemes decided, well, there's no point in waiting till November. If we're ready, let's move, go now. And so by moving up D-Day to June instead of November, uh, the Japanese didn't have enough time to get all of their equipment sorted. Plus, a lot of their ships that were bringing supplies and reinforcements down there were being sunk by American submarines before they could even get there. So a lot of the guns that were meant for Naftan Point and some other defensive positions were still sitting on the uh, down at Tanapeg Harbor. And just a question for you, Bruce. Were the people you interviewed who were on Saipan, you know, the, the locals, the Japanese, Japanese, did they talk about the fact there was a sense of the Japanese struggling to support places like Saipan in the, in the months before the invasion? Because we now know that they're struggling all across the Pacific with transportation and logistics. Well, you know, the, the, you know well, the, the news wasn't really available, but it got mm. through anyway, because one of the people I interviewed, um, uh, his, um, he went to Japan to study as a young boy. I'll get into that later if we have time. But his father was very nervous about the way the war was going and, and, uh, and uh, brought his son home early because they, they could see through whatever uh, uh, that the war was not going well for the Japanese. Um, so they knew, they knew things just weren't right, even though the Japanese weren't uh, sharing the news with them. But you know, the, the news back in Japan was being censored, too. Yeah, and of true. course, until the B-29 started burning down cities, well, there's no there's no hiding that, right? Okay. Next. Okay. Now, this is interesting. Well, I, I think it's all interesting, but this is the old Japanese jail there. Now, one of the people I interviewed was Manny T. Sablon. As a young lad, he was a messenger boy for the, uh, for the Japanese police, and he had access to the jail. Now, back in, it was either... April or May, there was a B-24 photo reconnaissance mission out of Kwajalein. They flew over uh, Saipan and Tinian taking photographs. One of the B-24s was shot down, uh, crashed in the ocean. There were four survivors, according to Manny uh, T. Sablon. They were held in the jail there, and then they were taken out. Now, uh, according to Manny, he was told that they were going to be put on a ship and sent back to Japan. But by that time in the war, orders from, uh, uh, from uh, Japan were to execute, execute Allied airmen. This was not always the case, but quite often it was. So we don't know if they were taken out and executed or if they were put on a ship and sent back to Japan. But if they were put on a ship going back to Japan, the odds were they didn't make it anyway because American submarines were sitting right off mm. the coast. Mm. 
I talked to people who said ships trying to come into Tanabeg Harbor blew up before they even got in or they blew up after they got out. So a lot they were trying to evacuate a lot of their civilians uh, and get them back to Japan at the same time bring in reinforcements with their supplies. But a lot of the people trying to escape never made it back because of the submarines. And as I said, reinforcements uh, did, had the same problem. But Matty said in one of his, uh, in his oral history, he said uh, most of the people there were, were locals. And when the Marines landed on 15 June, they told all of them, to, they let everybody out, said, head for the hills, you're on your own. Uh, if I may back out for a second, but Matty also said during the pre-invasion um, bombardment and softening up, uh, two uh, carrier pilots were shot down and captured. They were held in the jail. One of them ended up being killed by friendly fire before the Marines landed. And then as the Marines landed, the other one was taken out and decapitated. His partially uh, burned remains were found by the Marines as they moved up uh, into that part of the island. But he also said there was a, a Japanese who was being held there. And all I can remember his name was Ikuta. It says the reason he was being held there is because he spoke English better than he could Japanese and he was found to have a radio in his possession. Mm. So my book comes out and I think some woman from Chico, California, read the book, contacted me. She says, that's my grandfather. And the story goes that his family immigrated to uh, California in the early 1900s. Uh, he was only 12 years old. He grew up in the Oakland, Berkeley area, went to school there. Married a Caucasian woman, had three children. For whatever reason, the marriage ended a divorce. He had went back to Japan and at some point ended up on Saipan. But we don't know what happened to him after that. He was let out of prison. But at least after the book came out, this woman filled me in on who this guy really was. Mm -hmm. Next. And this is archival footage. Uh, look real close. There's a guy in there. He's got a flamethrower. And some of these guys had 12-gauge shotguns. Now, during the 60th anniversary of the Battle of Saipan, I was back there, and I talked to some of these Marines, and, and uh, one of them was a flamethrower operator. He says, but um, somewhere during the battle, uh, they were the flamethrowers were taken away because some of the civilians, both Japanese, uh, Korean, Okinawans, and, and uh, locals, Chamorros and Carolinians said, hey, look at these Marines. They're being rather indiscriminate, and they're just they're firing into these caves with civilians and incinerating them. So they took the uh, flamethrowers away from them. Uh, and the guy I talked to said he was more than happy to get rid of the flamethrower. Uh, and uh, like, I talked to some guys who had 12-gauge shotguns, and he says the thinking was that uh, they would be fighting, close in fighting, and they would need shotguns but he said you had to get pretty close to do damage with a shotgun and they were more than happy to get rid of those and, and pick up uh, m1s next and a lot of caves uh, a lot of natural limestone caves around there some of them are, are uh, man-made but i go in there there was all sorts of uh, artifacts from the war and a lot of these places you'll see there's uh, incense bottles prayer sticks and there was a letter, I don't know if it's written in kanji or whatever, but I found that in one of the caves. Somebody had left a letter, I'm guessing, to some uh, friend or loved one that uh, that uh, died in there. Uh, I've never been able to find anybody who could read it, though. Next. And this is one of the many natural limestone caves. This is towards the north end of the island near that airstrip, uh, uh, not too far from uh, Suicide Cliff. <clears throat> but those, some of those... Caves go down forever and ever. <coughs> and in this one, there's one way down and there's only one way back out because there's branches that go off to nowhere. So uh, you have to go down with a flashlight and people have gone down there before, tied a fluorescent ribbon all the way down so you could find your way up. So I went down by myself one time, which was a mistake, but my wife was waiting at the top. She didn't want to go in and my flashlight stopped working. So I got a bit of a panic, but I found if I shook it a little bit, it would come back on. So I scrambled out of there. But from that point on, I, when I went into caves, I made sure I could see the entrance from wherever I was. I became a bit claustrophobic after that. Next slide. Mm -hmm. And and it was in that cave that uh, I found this Japanese writing in one of the stalactites. And I had it translated. And the guy who had it trans translated said, this was a suicide note. Something to the fact that uh, the following individuals uh, are 
uh, are going to die here for the emperor. Wow. So and that, that's what he said it was said. So I can't verify it. Next. Yeah, and this is very typical. A lot of the caves I found uh, a lot of broken pottery, uh, pieces of clothing. If you look close, you can see some human long bones in there. Uh, people were either uh, killed there by satchel charges, flamethrowers, or maybe they committed suicide there. I don't know. Next. Uh, this was uh, a Marine I interviewed. Uh, he, see, a lot of those guys, uh, they were collecting souvenirs to take home, swords, flags, whatever. Uh, and some of them, you know, they go back to the ship and they survived the fighting and the sailors who couldn't get ashore would pay money for anything. Uh, he told me he could sell a Japanese helmet for five dollars but if he put a couple of bullet holes in it he'd get 50. <clears throat> and one japanese that he killed he took the wallet out and he found this photograph of a young woman and a child so uh there's a sad story there uh this mm -hmm. woman probably said goodbye to her husband never saw him again and has no idea what happened to him uh but this happened all over the world during world war ii every country people went off never came back their families don't even know what happened to them mm -hmm. uh next next the photo now, there was a Marine I, I talked to on the phone. I wanted to interview him, but he said he still had such bad memories. He really didn't think he could do an oral history interview. But next thing I know, a couple weeks later, I get this package in the mail, and it's a Japanese photograph album. He says, I found this in the rubble of Garapan, the main village there on the West Coast. He says, who knows? Maybe you can find the owner. I thought, well, that's a long shot. But in the photograph album, there was a postcard. Something written on the back. If it's like a typical postcard, there's a name and an address. So I had a friend in Tokyo at the time. I'd worked with him with the Bone Hunters when they were coming back. They found a mass grave. I'll go into that later. Um, but I, I made a copy of the back of the postcard, and I said, Hiro-san. Now, it's probably a, a slim chance of finding information. But can you see if there's anybody still at that address? And well, less than a week later, he says, not only is there somebody at that address, but the woman in the photo, lower left-hand corner, uh, is the woman it's addressed to by her husband. And the photograph album belonged to her husband. So I managed to get this return to her. She lived in a village near Osaka. Uh, I didn't go there to give it to her. and uh, But word came back to me the following year because representatives from her village and even some veterans from the Battle of Saipan came back to Saipan just to thank me for what I did, because she says uh, by returning that photograph album, she, after all these years, at least knows where her husband died. Next. Incredible work. I'm, I'm, I'm almost speechless at that, Bruce. Incredible work. I did this with another photograph album, too, but I didn't want to keep going. So anyway, next uh, slide. OK. <clears throat> now, I was in communication uh, for a while back in the 90s with Captain James B. Johnson. Uh, he was part of the Naval Administration there in uh, the Mariana Islands right after the war until the uh, United Nations uh, 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 turned it into a, uh, what do they call it? A, um, anyway, it became civilian control, but he stayed on there for about 14 years. And after the war, they were sending these salvage companies out there to try to clean up some of these islands because there's so much unexploded ordnance and just junk left over. And then he said, well, hey, Let's save some of it so that future generations will ha have at least some ideas of what happened here during the war. So across from the Hyatt Hotel, there's American Memorial Park, and there's some uh, this Japanese tank and some other stuff there. And at the bar far north of the island, I'll get into that in a bit, there's some other uh, artifacts left over from the war. And you're always seeing Japanese there having their photographs taken. So next photograph, please. Oh, uh, this is Juan Blanco. He's the guy I was telling you about. Uh, he's Chamorro. Um, they had segregated schools under the Japanese period. But in his oral history interview, he said that a uh, educator from Japan came to Saipan. And he said, you know, we'd like to take a, a couple of island kids back to Japan and give them a proper Japanese education and see if they, they're capable. And so I guess the principal of the school said, well, Juan, he's one of our brighter students. And uh, as they talked to his father, to make a long story short, he went back as a great school schooler 
Uh, he was lived with a couple, had no children of their own. They treated him like an adopted son. Uh, he went first day of class. He says everybody stared at him because they were told a native from Micronesia was coming to, to uh, be part of the class. And he says uh, they all looked at him and surprised. They, I, he says, I guess they expect to see somebody in a grass skirt with a bone in his nose. <laughs> but he adapted quite well. I integrated with the, his family and students. Uh, he did well academically. He did well in sports. Uh, but then his father, like I was starting to say earlier, was getting nervous about the way the war was going. Didn't want his son be, to be left up in Japan. So he came home. But if he came home, he'd have to go to a island school. And they only went to the fifth grade. So they arranged for him to go finish his studies in a Japanese school so he could go all the way through high school. And the way they did that was they gave him a temporary Japanese name. And then the, by the time he graduated from high school, he was the star pupil. It's sort of like in, here in New Zealand, we call them the ducks. He had the highest grade average. But even though he had a Japanese name, they said, but he's not really Japanese and we can't give it to him. So we'll give it to uh, the second best. So he was very upset, went home. And his teacher came and apologized to him. And his father said, it's nothing I can do about it. But this is a memorial that he and one of his classmates, they built uh, on the site where their old school was. And when I interviewed him back in the 90s, he would go to Japan every year for school reunions. He'd get together with his old classmates up there. And his classmates would come down to site now. Uh, he's, he's dead now. But anyway, we can go to the next slide. Uh, this is Roland Fraunheiser. 33rd Coast Artillery Battery. I guess these are the 155 Long Toms. Um, they were uh, used actually to help stop the Gilka side that, that took place right towards the end of the battle in July 1944. Uh, he came back to Saipan in 1996. And he said, I was trying to find where he had spent 15 months of the war, the last 15 months, because they were being held back uh, for the planned invasion of the Japanese home islands, which of course never came to pass. So he described to me basically where he was, and I knew, I, I just knew exactly where it was. I took him and we found, not only found the site where he was camped out and where they had their long times, we actually found the hard stand where his gun was and the brass ring that was there. So we packed that up and sent him home. Um, and then something he told me was, something else he told me was that they were stockpiling chemical shells for their uh, 155 long toms. The idea was, and this is, I think, general policy, that we were stockpiling chemical weapons in the Pacific and in Europe. Uh, and the idea was that if the other side used chemical weapons, we would retaliate in kind. Uh, matter of fact, there was a Liberty ship uh, off Italy that was hit by a Stuka and it contained uh, chemical weapons. And it killed a lot of people, not only on the ship from the chemicals, but people ashore. But I asked him, I said, well, after the war, what did they do with those chemical shells? And he says, I don't know. Well, I had a friend out there. He was retired Navy uh, explosive ordnance specialist. And he was on contract as a civilian because we were still finding bombs, shells, mortar shells, grenades, all sorts of things. We were still finding it in the jungle then. And we'd round them up and he would take them off someplace and explode them, uh, get rid of them. So I asked him, I said, well, this is according to Fraunheiser. They had chemical shells for their 155s. Do you know what happened to them? He says, look, and I hope you're not going to go advertise that. I don't want BBC and CNN coming out here trying to find out what happened to it. And I said, what happened to it? And he would tell me. So I don't know. Did they dump it in the ocean? Did they bury it? But they they had these stockpiled all over. Matter of fact, when I gave this lecture on the Dawn Princess some years ago, there was a retired Australian Army sergeant. And he said back in the 90s, they were in the Russell Islands, I think. They were going around doing the same thing, trying to round up old munitions. And I think it was the Russell Islands. He said they found chemical uh, shells for 155s scattered all over the ground out there. What they did is they called in the Americans. These Americans sent in a, uh, was it a C-131? And because at the time they had a chemical disposal facility on Johnson Island, they collected all the stuff and flew it back to Johnson Island. And he told me 
The last thing the Americans told him when they left was, do not tell anybody about this. So it's very possible there's still chemical shells out there in the mm -hmm. Pacific. Whether they're dumped in the ocean, buried someplace, I don't know. We may find out the hard way someday. Okay, yeah, no, definitely. Wow. Uh, this is what they call Paradise Valley. Um, this is on the west coast heading north. Uh, you can see a suicide cliff in the distance. This is where General Saito, the ranking IJA officer on the island, uh, was held up along with Admiral Nagomo. You remember Admiral Nagomo, Pearl Harbor, Battle of Midway. Well, eventually he lost favor and was given a fleet that was pretty much on paper. There were he didn't have much of a fleet out there in sight there. And what little he did was being sunk uh, by American submarines. But Nagomo and Saito were held up there. That's where they ordered the Gyokusai, uh, which is uh, better known as a bonsai. And then they committed suicide there. And then uh, the Gyokusai, that's when they just, uh, it was sort of piecemeal because they did, uh, the communication was a bit rough. But uh, I've talked to people who were in the 27th Infantry Division and the 10th Marines who uh, had artillery there. Uh, and they said they were just uh, drunk and screaming and they just came out at it and wave after wave and they were just mowing them down. And when they did a body count afterwards, they counted over 4,000 dead Japanese. But that's where they spent their last days. They committed suicide there. If you want to go to the next slide. And this is a little cave inside um, Paradise Valley. The Marines called it Paradise Valley because they said they could lob their mortar shells in there. There's so many Japanese in there that they were guaranteed to hit something. Uh, but this is supposedly the cave where Nagomo and Sato committed suicide. I've been in there many times. Every time I go in there, there are prayer sticks, incense. Obviously, Japanese were coming back there uh, to pay their respects or whatever. Uh, next. Matter of fact, uh, General Saito was giving a military burial somewhere near the beach. Nagomo's body has never been found, according to a friend of mine there. Uh, years ago, a Japanese soldier said he was buried in a cave somewhere there in Paradise Valley. Now, what we're looking at here is Suicide Cliff. I, I took the photo from the bottom. It's over 800 feet high. That's where people threw their children and jumped. Uh, if they didn't, then the Japanese killed them. Uh, now, next slide. And this is, I took from the top. Uh, now, according to witnesses, you know, it's not straight down. So a lot of the people kind of hit and bounce down. And somebody who climbed it one time said they found in some crags on the, up on the cliff, they found uh, skeletal remains of people who didn't make it all the way to the bottom. But that's what, uh, and you can find film footage on YouTube of people actually jumping off that cliff. Next. Oh, and this is Captain Oba. He was the last of the organized holdouts. Uh, after the Saipan was declared secure, there were quite a few Japanese hiding out in the jungle, uh, civilians and military personnel. And um, a number of people, including Guy Gabaldon, were dedicated uh, to going out and trying to hunt these people down. Matter of fact, Guy Gabaldon was shot and wounded by one of Oba's men. But this is where Oba was finally convinced to surrender. This is December 1945, several months after the war's over. Next. We're getting towards the end here, but this is typical. This is right at the north end of the island, um, right at the base of Suicide Cliff, actually. And there's a lot of uh, artifacts from the war left there. And the Japanese, like I said, they started coming back in the 70s to build hotels, golf courses, a favorite honeymoon place. It's only about three three hours from Tokyo by plane. People come down there on vacation. Uh, they get on tour buses. And they uh, they spend a day getting a, a tour of the islands. Uh, they would get off of places like that. They would sit on benches, have their photographs taken, and then they get back on the bus and go to the next uh, next stop, next photo. Yep. Okay, uh, in 1944, not. But right in the area where the Gyokusai took place, uh, the Japanese were getting ready to build another hotel. It was right just the south of Aqua Resort where I used to take my kids to go swimming. <clears throat> they were boring some test holes there before uh, starting construction, and the test boards were bringing up skeletal remains. So they stopped 
they notified the Japanese consulate. They brought in the bone hunters. That's what we called them. <clears throat> And they started excavating uh, the place and uh, they found a mass grave there. They think they pulled at least 500 remains out of there. And these were some of the people who were part of that. Now, uh, one of these guys I talked to had a farm in the area uh, back before the war. This fellow on the far right was one of the few Japanese soldiers to survive the fighting. I mean, they had an estimated 28,000 combat personnel there. And I think fewer than 2,000 actually survived. And um, so I got to talk to him um, and I said, well, why did you surrender? Were you wounded and you couldn't kill yourself? He says, no, I just got tired of fighting and threw my hands up. And I said, well, you're very lucky because the Marines had a habit of uh, killing Japanese soldiers, even if they tried to surrender. Uh, so what's next? Is that the end of my slides? Um we got one more, I think, or is that just a, that's just, no, there we are. One well, more. I have to mention that because the Chinese have been uh, making moves in the area. Uh, some years ago when I was there, uh, they tried to pass a law allowing the Chinese to build casinos there, and the people voted it down. Well, somehow the Chinese got back in there after I left. I don't know if they bribed local politicians or businessmen or whatever. So they're there in force. And this is, this is Garapan, the main village there. Uh, and they started building this casino. It's massive. Uh, and then they brought in Chinese workers disguised as tourists, but they never left. And then they ran out of money and they couldn't finish the job and they couldn't pay their employees. So these Chinese tourists who were working on the place went on strike. So the FBI got involved. Um, anyway, it's a monstrous. It just it just sticks up above everything else like a like a giant hemorrhoid is the way I describe it. Anyway. <laughs> Anyway, the Chinese are, are back there. They do have designs on the place as part of what they call this Second Island, second island Chain. Uh, if they get their way, uh, they will push the Americans back as far east in the Pacific as they possibly can. Mm -hmm. I belong to the United States Naval Institute, so I get their proceedings. And in every issue, there are articles about how the Marines, the Navy, the Coast Guard are uh, preparing for a future war with China. So. Well, anyway, that, that's it. There's much more I could share with you, but I, you wanted me to keep it. Well, I'd, li I'd like to sh you to share a couple of stories because I used a couple of the photos you sent me to make the graphic for YouTube. So um, Joe and Norm Stanton, could you just share their story quickly? Well, that uh, his uh, uh, Norm Stanton's oral history is in my book, uh, Voices from the Pacific War. Uh, that's having been a, a petty officer uh, in the Navy during the Vietnam War. Uh, I wanted to get the stories of enlisted personnel in the Pacific. And Norm was one of the people uh, I uh, interviewed. He didn't go into the Navy until 1943, but before Pearl Harbor, his older brother, after graduating from high school, went to the Navy. He was made part of the Asiatic fleet uh, under then Admiral Tommy Hart. Uh, and Tommy Hart was so convinced that war with Japan was going to start at any moment, he moved most of his ships out of Chinese waters down to the Philippines, where supposedly uh, General MacArthur's Air Force would offer some aerial protection. Of course, MacArthur lost his Air Force uh, within 24 hours, and he had to send his ships, uh, scatter them to other parts of the Philippines, eventually to the Dutch East Indies. And then as that fell apart, the Japanese were moving into the Dutch East Indies, a lot of these ships tried to escape to Australia. Uh, USS Asheville, which was a... Um, a um, a gunboat, uh, tried to escape to Australia, but was intercepted by a Japanese cruiser squadron and was blasted out of the water. Only one member of that crew survived. And the only reason he survived, according to my information, was because the captain of one of the cruisers wanted to know information about the ship they had sunk. Now, the story is a bit mixed after that. One story is that survivors were taken aboard Japanese ships, then executed and thrown back over. And the other story was that they were just left to drown. So that's the story of uh, Joe and Norm Stanton. And uh, and you you also spoke to some of the, the Nisai Americans who were in that part of the world as well. What kind of experience did, that, or experience did they share with you? Well, I did interview, uh, I can't remember his name now, it's in my Saipan book, but he was uh, Nisei Japanese. Is I think they were from, uh, the San Joaquin Valley someplace, Dinuba, I'm not sure. Um, but then when Pearl Harbor happened, his uh, uh, his 
family was rounded up and sent off to internment camps. Um, but he uh, volunteered for the army, or maybe he was already in the army, yeah. So even though they were considered enemy aliens and they were sent off to internment camps, they still had uh, military obligations. I think he was already in the army, and because he spoke Japanese, he was uh, made part of the 27th Infantry Division, and so he was uh, interrogating uh, prisoners and also trying to uh, go through documents that were captured, deciding which were important and needed to be sent back to Pearl Harbor for translation. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Well, basically, I've got loads of requests to bring you back for another show sometime in the future to carry on these stories because uh, you're, you're a mine of information. Your local knowledge is, is shining through. So I have really enjoyed today. So um, well, I'd website... really like to do another one. One, of, uh, one I would really like to do is beyond the missing in action from the Pacific War. Yeah, let's do it. I would. OK, so but uh, yeah, I'll be in touch and uh, anything else. Brilliant. So, folks, we have another show again later on today or tomorrow, depending on where you are. Mark Forsdyke is coming on to talk about the battle for Bamboo Hill. That's an action of the Suffolks near Imphal and Kohima in Burma. So we'll do that later on. And I've been scheduling shows busily, uh, working on my casino series all through May and other battles in Italy. But right now, thank everybody for watching. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, viewers. I will see you all next time. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Okay.